And welcome to the CRM MVP podcast, episode number 42, recorded here in Austin from Extreme 365. So today was uh, day one, well, day two if you count the you know Sunday for the executive exchange, but it was really day one today where we had our first keynote because I think we have another keynote tomorrow morning. And the, the speaker of the keynote was Cecilia Flumbaum, and she was talking about sort of the future of Dynamics, and she talked about changes that are coming to the partnership program because exchange is mainly a conference for partners so it was heavily based on partners and you know the opportunity out there and you know we were we were looking at what she was talking about the prediction she was making and we started thinking about you know is there any chance we can come up with a list of predictions that you know that we can revise in a couple of years and see if it became true or not so i invited Four fellow MVPs. I think everyone but Jerry has been on, on the show before. And I invited four fellow MVPs and I, I said, how about we put together a list of 10 predictions that we can see happening within the next three years that are not covered on, on their NDA, meaning these are not based on something that we know. So if this happens, is purely speculation. We just got lucky and sort of hit it, but it's definitely not something that we're shooting for. Um, and can we put together a list of 10 things that, you know, we think are going to happen in three years. Now, the rules were simple. The rules were we're going to put together a list. Each one of us is going to come up with two predictions and none of us knows what the predictions are. So we're just sort of going to react on the show. Um, and, uh, we'll see how it goes. So before we get started with the list, I want to welcome the guests of the show. First, I'm going to start with Nick. Nick, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Gus. Nick Dolman, MVP, Business Applications. Canadian. Uh, Canadian. Power lifter. Uh, power lifter. Part-time. I'm on your yeah, podcast more than my own. Part-time, yeah, guest of the CRM MVP podcast. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Uh, Jonas, welcome back. That's back-to-back episodes for you. Thank you. In yeah, two different countries. In two different countries. And this country very far away. But good to be uh, here. We did one good in your be... country, Sweden, and now you're Yeah, in the I gotta US. pay back or you pay back or whatever. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Steve, welcome back to the show. This is what, show number five for you or four or five, something like that? Present. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back. And then again, first timer, Jerry Weinstock. Welcome. Hi everybody. All right. There you go. So those are the five MVPs and obviously myself. We're going to write two uh, predictions, again, that we think are going to happen within the next two years. And I asked the guys to stretch it out, right, to really think about what are things that we think are far-fetched, not super simple that we can see coming, right? Those are too easy. Let's think about things that are far-fetched out there that we actually think they're going to happen, but we have no idea if they're going to happen or not. So let's get this party started. Nick. What do you have for prediction number one? For prediction number one, I'm gonna start, let's start with something a little fun. Um, I predict that Microsoft will be the first company to have a data center in space. What? And you think about it, they built wow, that data three center. Years? Within they, three years? Jesus, what are you, you talking about? You never about? know. So they put that, that data center down in the North Sea, right? Underwater, yes. cooling and everything like that. Think about it. You put a data center up in space as a satellite, you have solar power, so you have your energy there. In terms of heating and cooling, you're in space, it's cool. I think they're big. <laughs> oh, that's cool. <laughs> hey, hey we're, we're, we're spitballing here, and oh I think their biggest challenge is just getting the, the throughput and the data there, nope, but I think look, that's I, achievable. I, I, I personally love this prediction, and I'll tell you <laughs> why. Because whenever my customers complain about latency, I'm gonna be like, dude, you have no idea how lucky you are you're not hosted in space right now. That latency is horrible. So I guess I'll have to work a deal with Elon Musk to get it up there, right? Exactly. Oh, exactly. Oh, he'll be involved be a, for sure. It'll be a yeah. collaboration between but, but Microsoft think, and SpaceX. But think SpaceX. about it. You know, if they can be – this is like the, the, the whole space race between the United States and the Soviet Union to get to the moon. Pff, yeah. That's nothing. The new space race between Microsoft and Amazon and Salesforce – to mm. get a data data center up in space, who's going to win that space race? Yeah, yeah but Maybe what would the incentive be? I mean, why would they want to do that? Just to be the first, or no? The, like reason, the, business, business, the, the, value the reasons I just said. There's the the in terms of energy, you have a direct more access from solar power to the sun. Mm -hmm. You have the whole cooling thing resolved, and like I said, there's. But was you just, do you do know that in order to get this thing in space, whatever they're going to spend to get it up there, they could build like ten data centers without money, like all over the world. You, you got to start somewhere. 
I, th- got I, it. I, I, wait, I thought you were going to say maybe like I thought you were going to say like North Korea where you're going to like Kim Jong Un <laughs> was going to convert you know one of his no, underground think, nuclear places I, to I, a I Microsoft space, data center. I think space is more feasible. I thought it was going yeah. for Spain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think Spain would. Uh, no, and the other thing I, I wanted to mention, just a little aside here, you said you're right. This is this is not breaking NDA. None of these things mm-hmm. we've ever heard of, an inkling of. On that flip note, if Microsoft takes one of our ideas data center in space i think we should deserve some credit for that yeah, we should name it right yeah yeah yeah, yeah that would be the a mix station <laughs> where is the support Dating where is the support face. group going to be based for the uh, data center that's in space <laughs> on the moon <laughs> does gdpr apply up there it's pro- hey, another water. good reason to have it up in space yeah. Yeah. no rules <laughs> no loss you can do whatever wow that was uh, that was an interesting one to start with uh, it's only gonna get better from here, I think. So, Jonas, what do you think? What's your uh, first prediction, which will be number two in our list? Yeah, I think in three years from now, the Azure SQL will be replaced or will lose the first spot as a data storage in the cloud to the CDS platform. Because hmm. the CDS, I mean, they're aiming for all kinds of targets in, in the businesses, and uh, yeah, they're they having a good story. So. Yeah, I'm saying um, CDS is getting passing SQL Server in the Azure for the well, number is, one is, data but, store. But what is CDS hosted on? Yeah, it's SQL. Okay. But so, it's, so it's a new, the new uh, sort of that's the interface that the developers so, and everyone uses. Oh, so, so you're so working you're with CDS so instead of working with SQL. SQL. I yeah. see. I see what you're saying. So yeah. So if I'm a developer and I'm building an app, like we're not talking a, a Dynamics or a Power mm-hmm. App. Like I'm Visual Studio, I'm not going to connect to Azure SQL. I'm going to connect to CDS. That's yeah, because be that's the, the obvious choice. Because okay. that's I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good prediction. Simple. But you guys have anything on that? Sounds no? legit. Sounds okay. legit. I'm the techie here, so no, no opinions that's from anyone else. That's a good prediction. That's a good prediction. Good right. job. All right, Steve. What do you got? Prediction number three. You know, three years is a long time, a lot. I mean, you look back three years and where we are now. A lot of a lot of stuff has happened that. Three years ago, I don't think we could have predicted. So that's that's a big time scale to think so, about. So, okay, so that's a good that's a good comment that you made. Now I want to ask you guys, and this is outside of the list that we have, but what's happening right now that three years ago you wouldn't have predicted? CDS, CDS, Naked CRM, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, platform license, uh, splitting into apps, um, Power Apps, the Canvas apps becoming Power part apps, of the Canvas platform. App, yeah. And actually, Almost the, everything the fact we're that, working with right now. Yeah. <laughs> the know? fact that we actually got the Naked XRM, we've been dreaming about it for quite some years, but they actually went there. I think the fact that they launched this thing called Project Sienna that looked a little shaky in the beginning, and now it is the thing that's become Power Apps. And Power Apps is our life going forward. Yeah. None of this three years ago. None of this. No one would have predicted this. Yeah. Well, we would have, but we didn't do this episode then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 we should have started three years ago. Okay, so what's your actual So prediction? actually, my, my, my prediction, I'm going to start with an easy one. It's, it's right. kind of a, off of that one. It's not going to take three years, but I think that, that the idea of the Power Apps license for ISVs to be able to build solutions, all restrictions are going to be removed for that. All of the what, what first-party the, first application protection mechanisms that are involved right now to protect the first-party apps uh, from cannibalization by ISVs building on, right. on the app, I think all of that goes away. That playing field gets completely leveled, and the first-party apps compete with third-party apps. And I think, I think it's a wide open market. And I think that's going to happen in a lot less time than three I, years. I, I agree with Steve. One of my throwaway ideas that I didn't pick for my top three was the first party apps will go away. So my idea was a throwaway of Nick's. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> no, first I, I party think, apps going away. I think the no, ISV. So Microsoft will not deliver the, the sales, sales customer service? service? I think the ISVs can do a better job. Well, and we, I know that's we, a bold uh, statement. Yeah, but and they will focus on CDS, so that's why it will pass SQL. It will be building on built on CDS, <laughs> and <laughs> so you weren't really making a, a, a case for it. You just wanted to confirm your prediction. Yeah, One absolutely, more of course, of course. <laughs> Isn't that why we're here? No, like, so, I, and I'm not I'm not trying to blow, uh, you know, trying to pump Steve up or anything. But I've I've looked at his rapid start and what he's put together, and I'm like, this is what a lot of my customers should have been using, and not some of the first party apps. 
Yep. So here's five dollars for that. And, <laughs> and I mean, but, uh, but American but, dollars. You nice. know, when you think about it, I mean, they built the first party apps as like a Swiss Army knife. Any business, mm -hmm. this will fit any business, which That's really right. means it doesn't fit any business. So the opportunity for the platform license, once they remove any kind of restrictions or hindrances, is you know what? I'm going to build solutions for a business, and a, and I got a business in mind. It's not Swiss Army knife. I got a business in mind and a business scenario, and I'm going to build for that, and I'm going to launch that to that target. And that target is gonna buy that over the first party every single time. And that's gonna be the challenge I think for the first party is there's a lot of bright ISVs out there that could yeah. say, you know what? I see a use case here that I can get specific and targeted, not a Swiss army knife, it's a, it's a razor blade for that particular industry. Some other ISV is gonna hit another one and this Swiss army knife is gonna have trouble finding a place. So, so what you're saying is initially years ago when we had this Four pillars, sales, marketing service, and XRM. We're just going to have one pillar. It's going to be XRM. That's what Nick was saying, but I don't disagree with it. He, he extended my prediction okay. to the logical conclusion. So it's, basically, <laughs> so it's basically not even a pillar. It's just a platform. It's the it's core. It's a Absolutely. single pillar, whatever you call that. <laughs> Because you're going to think pillar. it's the power, the power be there. Like, let's say an insurance, a specific insurance company comes. Are you going to try to modify opportunities and cases to fit that business model? Or are you going to build that business model from ground up? When, and you got three ISVs out there that saw that opportunity and built three different versions of an insurance business application on Power Apps that they could pick from. Why would they ever pick the Swiss Army Knife? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we should all start just building vertical solutions and have them ready for when the, the first party app goes away. That well, is what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> you still my idea. All right. Well, that was good. That was good. Some uh, solid first three predictions. So, uh, so I want to take I want to take Power Apps a little further. So I think what's going to happen with Power Apps is that we'll be able to make it available to our customers' customers, so that the licensing restriction, the technical or business, depending upon how you look at it, that you will not have to be a member of the tenant to use the Power App that we'll be able to build it out and give it to our customers. And as a consequence, um, I think Power Apps will be one of the top 10 apps to download off the iOS store. You think that will wow. take three years? I think it's going to happen within three years. Okay. I, I, I think it's a classic. It's not technical. It's, it's business. And my suspicion is, is that and my premise on a lot of things relative to the what drives the roadmap is is what Gartner thinks. Mm -hmm. And when Gartner says, "Hey, you guys ought to be revisiting the way you're handling power apps," and we'd move you up to the quadrant, that little magic corner, a little bit farther up, um, if you let your customers' customers use power apps, I think that's going to so be that, a factor. I mean, Absolutely. that kind of exists in the market already, right? So I'm, I'm like Best Buy, and I've got some, some application that I've built our business on, but I make available my mobile app to my customers to log in, do yes. business with me. So yes. you're thinking Power Apps goes that route where I can, I can push out a Canvas app to the, the general public. Yes, well, yes, so and, and, and that gets back to your point that Microsoft can get out of the mobile app business and they can lower their support costs they can lower their um, all these related costs about trying to figure stuff out all they need to build is the tools they don't have to build the houses well yeah so so right now and in, in the way I, I sort of see this is right now for a power app you have to log in whether you're doing canvas or you're doing model driven it doesn't matter you log in with a user account but my argument was can these user accounts be contacts like they are on their on portals? Mm -hmm. That way you can add your customers in there because in some cases you want to control who can log into this app, right? Maybe you only want to create an app so customers can create cases or they can request a, a technician to come to the house or whatever it is. So in some cases you might not want it to be fully open like a Best Buy app where they can shop for stuff. But you want it to be, you know, you want to control who can log in. But we can control that with contacts. I mean, we do it today for portals. Why can't we do it with Power Apps? Exactly. So yeah. I just don't think if that's going to take three years. I think this thing is coming one it's year. It's logical. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. 
um, because that would be, yeah, it would open it up to a, a gazillion different uses. To confirm under NDA, no one has told us this is happening. Of this course. is a prediction <laughs> right. of Jerry Weinstock. That's right. right. I heard yes. it from Jerry. Yes. That's, I heard that's, it from Jerry right. first. This is, yeah. this is my belief that this will be the first prediction happen. to come true. <laughs> you know, we'll see what's happening in the license. Maybe it's going to come out in uh, the next release for April. Maybe they've already got it figured out. I don't wow. know. Yeah. I don't know. No but I, th I, think, I think the big thing is, is that as it comes out, it will become a phenomenal platform because Power Apps, on the other hand, doesn't have to connect to Dynamics 365. It could be the product that empowers people through the Microsoft environment to connect to lots of different backend databases. Okay, so now I, I, have, a, I have a question for all of you, I guess, about this. We are in the age of the citizen developer, right? Where we are supposed to have all these people who have no background in technology. And, you know, they mentioned this example of a doctor creating an app, being able to create power apps. So do you think that if power apps went mainstream, meaning you don't have to have a user account, you can just create them openly or you can authenticate people with contacts in CDS. They don't even have to be Dynamics 365 contacts. They can just leverage CDS for this, do you see it as this thing being mainstream? Like anyone could, like right now, any kid that knows Photoshop can create logos and they can do all kinds of stuff. Is that how you see it? Like anyone with minimal training could start creating mobile apps? Well, there's there's lots of apps out there to allow you to develop a mobile app without oh. having to write native code. Okay, but, but at the same time, the beauty about Power Apps is that a lot of it is already built for you. The authentication mechanism, you don't have to program that. You don't have to deal with uh, you know, the database structure that's all organized by the data source that you're pulling from. And at the same time, when you create the app and you publish it, it works in like anything you can install the Power App app on, right? the Power App Player, which is called, I think. So if you can install that, which you can do in iOS, Android, Windows, then your app just works on all those platforms. So I think that's the advantage of it. I think the jury's still out because we got we got Canvas apps and model driven. I don't think both of those are going to exist as separate things for very long. But they're very different, though. I know they're yeah, very the, different, the whole... but, I, but I, I get a sense that that in, in, in the fullness of time, using Microsoft terminology, that uh, that there's only going to be the, a one. That they're not going to have both of those paths. There's only going to be one. I so think which gonna be one. which I think. I because they are very different in topology and hugely you know, they they're polar opposites like they they shouldn't even be bo both called power apps agreed no. agreed i think that's I, I, a major I, I, agree I, I, that's a mistake in yeah. the packaging because you could say i'm really good at power apps and all you know how to do is model driven apps and that yeah, and that doesn't Cover okay, so this is my bonus segment. prediction. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but, but hold on, hold on. Before you give us your, your bonus prediction, for Dynamics 365 experts, and this is me because I, you know, I teach the, the, the Power Apps boot camp or whatever. I, when I started learning Power Apps and I learned about Canvas and, and Model Driven, like I fell from scale from 1 to 10. Canvas apps, I was a 1. I was at the beginning, I'm just learning this stuff. But when I looked at model driven apps, I'm like, I'm already like an eight on this thing because it's dynamics. I mean, it's dynamics 365 mm. straight up configuration. Um, so they are so completely different. And, and when you say we're gonna have one of those two, I just, I just wanna know what you think is, gonna, when I think of power apps, I think of canvas apps. That's how I see it. Every time somebody says power apps, I immediately think of canvas apps. I think model driven apps are like, it's a glorified, it's a glorified site Dynamics 365 apps. Glorified I, site map editor. Yeah. yeah. But can I sort of course, speak of course, for you, Steve? Of course, model driven has nothing to do with mobile. I mean, model driven is the same XRM platform we built, everything we built. No, but I, mean, I, I wouldn't I mean, say it's it has responsive, a, this is so not it's mobile, mobile in that respect. This but. is not mobile or not. It's a completely different aspect approaches to present your data, to, to give the user an interface to work with. So maybe what you, if I'm putting words in your mouth, could be referring to, I mean, in the Canvas apps today, you can, you have this template, you start from an entity or start from data or whatever it's called, and then you get a list and you get a form. That's the closest you get to a model-driven app because model-driven apps is all about the lists and the forms. So, okay, so, so is that what you're seeing? You're expanding, you're using the Canvas apps, but you have these templates where it's 
sort of model driven because you base it on the data structure or you know i'm not the developer on the table but you're not but i'm not but but i i definitely see the canvas app and model driven ultimately becoming a single experience for either developers or users, a single, a single, not, it's not, as Jerry said, it, it really made a lot of confusion right there. They feel like two completely separate things. They're both sitting on CDS. I think they were designed for a different audience today, right? Canvas is really thinking about that citizen developer, giving them that, that platform that the citizen dev developer can work on. And the model driven is more for, you know, it's old legacy XRM guys, but I see those two merging into just a single experience for both. I don't technically know how they're going to do no, that. So I, I heard so, you say that. I want to know I what you see in front of yourself when you say that. That's what I'm thinking. And, and I think when you think about the citizen developer role, I mean, they're, they're, what they're going to do is they're going to solve problems with apps, whether it's model canvas, that they would have never paid a partner to solve. So they're going to solve a whole list of problems that never would have been solved. Because they would never have paid someone to solve it, but some sharp guy in the in the warehouse is is going to say, you know what, I need an app, and he couldn't have got IT to budget for it, so it never would have happened. But he's now got a tool where you know what, I can I can build something, and, and he's going to build something. Check in trucks or whatever. As they whatever come it in. is, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's going to solve his own little problem with this thing, and and it, that's great. And what what's going to happen is he's going to solve his little problem, and suddenly it's going to become mission critical to the whole organization. This little app he built is going to be, everybody's going to be dependent on it. It's going to be the most, then it gets taken over by IT, then a partner comes back in, it gets refined. But I think we're going to see a whole bunch of ultimate projects that are started by the warehouse guy who's got Starting a problem. The, the, the Heathrow stories. The Heathrow story, you, exactly. You've seen that, that's happened before. Like I, I think all of us have been into clients where Here's an access database that mm -hmm. Agnes created five years ago that everybody now uses. Yep, mission we, critical. Mission critical, and let's let's refactor that into Dynamics that. 365. Mm -hmm. So we've we've heard this story before. Those tools are getting more and more accessible now. Yep. But I see those tools merging. The tools we use oh, and tools we use. I see it becoming a single tool. I, I would actually, yeah, I would say the. Um, That's not even on my list of predictions. That was an extra, extra bonus prediction. <laughs> yeah, they're going to merge, yeah. I think. The Steve prediction. Okay, so that was uh, prediction number four. Good job, Jerry. Um, okay, so here's my first prediction, and this will be prediction number five. I think that within three years, Microsoft will stop releasing on-prem releases. I think they will continue to support the versions that are out there because the support life cycles are public. People expect them when they bought 2016 or whatever, they expect them to be supported for this many years. But... You know, we just saw it this year where the April release came out and no on-prem on-site, right? There was nothing, uh, which the April release came in like July, but that's besides the point. <laughs> the point is there was no on-prem uh, release at all. And then now on-prem was released for this one. So they finally released something for on-prem. I think that within three years, and I don't know if they're gonna do this in 2019 or 2020 or 2021, but I think within three years, they'll just stop releasing on-prem and they'll just say, for new customers, online only, we don't sell on-prem anymore. For the customers that we have on-prem, we'll support you until you want to, but whenever you need to renew or whatever it is, you need to go online. So that's what I think. What do you guys think? No I, objections. I, I think two things. Two things have that. Right now, they're using that story for this hybrid scenario because Salesforce is cloud only. And you have customers out there that can, they can take this hybrid scenario of on-premise and cloud, and we can do this hybrid, which today is a, a nice sales story for certain customers that maybe are still on the fence. Willing to put a foot in, not put everything in. So the hybrid story today is a sellable story. But Do you think that the hybrid story could sort of evolve or merge into maybe Asher, where you're on-prem but you're on Azure kind of thing like a platform as a service yeah like could that be something they switch to you know what in my mind you're not on-prem anymore if you're in Azure I mean yeah you're you maybe you're on a VM in Azure but in my mind you're not on-premise technically anymore right. you're, you're in the Microsoft cloud ecosystem maybe not the ideal way they'd like to be for you but you're in there you're you're consuming Azure you're you're on the plan, plan they'd like you to be on Maybe not the way they'd like you to get in, but but I, I do think that 
Microsoft historically, when when they've announced some issue or you know, think about the the Outlook uh, thick client deprecation, and you had so many clients out there that were, oh, you can't get rid of it, we're not ready, and they and they kind of they kind of folded their, their hand on that and backed off of that, and I think the the, the life of on premise will last as long as Microsoft is willing to buckle to customers that, oh, I'm not ready for cloud. And that's what I feel they keep doing. They keep buckling. And, you know, the other side is there's no two versions of CRM, right? There's no CRM on-prem and CRM online. There's just CRM. They just release it sometimes to on-prem and, you know, uh, online. Now, online has some capabilities that the on-prem version doesn't do, but they don't have these two versions they're sort of building alongside or anything. It's just one version of it. Now, I think that one of the motivations for them not to get rid of it is the fact that because it's the same version, if we're already developing for online, yeah, it's a pain to release on-prem and having to do support and all of that, but it's not a big deal. It's not like they have these on-prem product that they have to keep maintaining. They will have to keep doing that for online anyway. So I think that adds up to it, but I feel that within three years, either the current leadership or some somebody new who comes in, maybe they'll steal somebody from Salesforce, I don't know. But somebody will come and say, yes, I know it's a good story. Yes, I know you're gonna lose some sales potentially because they would have picked you because you're on-prem, but the headache is not worth it. I think you should go online, start innovating like crazy, forget about on-prem, and I hope within three years they do it. I think they will do it. That's why, that's my prediction. You know, think, I, think about- I, I, I think something a little different. I think. I want to look at it from who's still on on on-prem. So we have one large group that is still using 2011 or 2013. They're not very much invested in the package. It never quite worked out. They're maybe using it as a glorified electronic database. They really don't need any new features or functions. They're barely using what they have today. They probably let software assurance expire, so they'd have to go out and buy new licensing, the new licensing pricing. And they don't need any new bells and whistles because it is what it is. Um, you've got another group of people out there that has have perhaps a very complex on-premise implementation with some other on-premise ERP system or something along those lines. And they've got so much code and so much integration that to move them forward uh, is pretty expensive. And as the product team release comes up with the next release, all the cool, great, fantastic features are going to be cloud dependent, and therefore the next release of on-prem is not going to be that compelling. That's going to be worth the investment of time, energy, and effort for somebody that's already on-prem to moving up to you know doing an upgrade that has a slightly better UI or something along those lines. They're they're just going to stick where they are. So I think to that extent. I would differ, disagree a little bit. I just think Microsoft doesn't have to spend very much effort supporting on-prem from a superficial standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree. Like I mentioned, I think that's one of the major <laughs> factors why they haven't right. gotten rid of on-prem. But again, I just think that at some point, something is going to snap on leadership. And they're going to be like, you look, you know, whoever is on Prem will support him as long as the life cycle is out there. But then after that, they have to go online. I mean, there's always going to be people, like you mentioned, companies that are using on Prem and they don't see any need to upgrade even to on Prem on the newer version, let alone online. But, you know, that's why there's people out there, uh, out there just still driving Hummers, right? And they don't even exist. They don't make them anymore. And you right. see them out on the streets. So I think that, you know, there are some companies out there that are not going to move. And, uh, you know, some days it's either not going to work or they'll use it forever. I, I remember working for a company that all of our time entry into the system was like from the early 90s or something. And the system looked awful, but it was a custom system that worked fine to just enter hours and they never failed the need to upgrade. And it was a CRM partner. And we were using this proprietary, you know, clock timing system or whatever that I was like, we can custom, we can do what this thing is doing in like three hours in Dynamics. And they were like, no, we have no interest. That system works. We have records from like the, the time we opened the start of the company and uh, we're going to keep using that. So yeah, I think that there are companies that are not going to want to move, but I don't think that should stop Microsoft from, from getting rid of it. So No, I'm, I mean, and one thing doesn't contradict the other. Yeah. If, they, if they are happy on the 2011, 2013 something, they don't care if they don't release a 10.2 version of uh, on-premise. Right. So, so they are still happy and Microsoft can still 
say let's ditch uh, on premise. Yeah, I think it has to do with kind of the definition of get rid of on prem. What you mean by that? I mean, obviously, if if somebody has on premise software they bought is sitting there, Microsoft's not going in and tearing it out. Of so course. it's a matter of we're no longer going to support that. We're no no longer going to extend that. And support is probably the biggest key factor for Microsoft because even in the cloud side, as recent as that is, now we're moving to a single version. We're moving to a single version, so they don't have to support one version because. When you got two, three versions in the market, you're supporting two or three versions. On-premise is just un, an unlimited number of potential versions that are still out there supporting. So they, in, in an ideal world for, my, uh, world for Microsoft, from a support standpoint, there's one version of one product in one place that they support. Yeah. So that's the logic of getting that's the logic on-premise. Behind the prediction. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Makes that's sense. That's awesome. So what I want to do now is let's go backwards. So I'm going to go for prediction number six, then Jerry, Steve, and so on. Let's just go it uh, in reverse now and see what we get. So here's my prediction number two. This is an ambitious one, but I think it's going to happen within three years. I think Microsoft is going to acquire Click Dimensions. So that's my far-fetched prediction. The reason for that, and I'll tell you why I predict an acquisition of Click Dimensions. I think that Click Dimensions... A couple of years ago, when Microsoft, or a few years ago, when Microsoft acquired Marketing Pilot, had was under different leadership. We know that, and it wasn't bad leadership, but I think that they were heavily invested on the U.S. market. They weren't really gung ho about becoming a global company. I think that they were sort of like we're available the same way we Elevate Solutions will take customers from anywhere. You come from Mongolia and you want to implement Dynamics? If we can work together, we'll do it. Um, I think that's how Click Dimensions approached their global reach. Now, they did invest in going to Australia and going to conferences and stuff like that, but I don't think they were sort of committed passionately about growing this thing and making it a global company. I think that Mike Dickerson, their current CEO, who's a stud, right? He's growing the company and making it a global organization. And I think that because of that, even if the, the Dynamics CRM, uh, Dynamics 365 for marketing app continues to grow, I think that at some point it will make sense for Microsoft, especially because Click Dimension is on top of the Azure platform. I think that at some point it will make sense for Microsoft to get those customers and move them into Dynamics marketing or figure out a way to include the technology that Click Dimensions has developed since its inception back in 2010 or whenever Click Dimensions came up. So I predict within three years, Microsoft will acquire Click Dimensions. You are 100% wrong on that one, Gus. No right. way that happens. No way that happens. Why? Why? Well, my prediction, I'm jumping ahead of Jerry because you brought up the topic, but my next prediction was going to be in, well, in way less than three click years. Click Dimensions is gone. <laughs> Wait, well, no, I wasn't going to mention click dimensions at all. Right. I was going to say in way less than three years, Dynamics 365 for marketing will be far and away the number one marketing application wow. for Dynamics for a couple of reasons. All right. One. Let's hear this one. This is going to be good. They've got all the resources at their disposal to build an absolute Mac Daddy solution. Two, that thing was built from ground up today on the latest technology, built on CDS from the jump. The nothing, no legacy code it has to be, you know, retrofitted back. It was built on the modern platform from the jump. Three, Dynamics Marketing is going to get put in front of that customer's face at the same time anything else Dynamics is going to get put in front of that customer's face, potentially bundled maybe, long before any other third-party ISV even knows that customer exists. I, I don't know if I agree with you on that. And the reason for that is because... That would be because you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, I would agree with you, but then we would both be wrong. Um, no, but like the, uh, the, the reason why I don't necessarily agree with you on that is because who ultimately puts Dynamics in front of customers, at least most customers or prospects, is partners. So this is not up to Microsoft. This is up to partners. And the reality is, at least today, and maybe next year it will be different, at least today, I would say out of 100 partners, I would say 99 of them will be way more comfortable putting click dimensions in front of a prospect than putting the marketing app. And it might be all because of ignorance, because we don't know how good the marketing app is. We don't know what's possible. But the reality is, is that somebody brings up business-to-business -business marketing automation today. I'm thinking of click dimensions, personally. And we talked about this on the last episode. But um, even if 
dynamics for marketing becomes the number one solution, I still can see how it would make sense to acquire the number two solution at that point, if that would be Click Dimensions. What, what would be the upside to Microsoft to buying Click Dimensions? A customer list. Well, Customers because, to transfer over to their solution. Okay. So there's no, there's no IP that they would buy from Click Dimensions that they don't either already have better IP or are creating or in a position to create better I, IP on the I modern platform. I don't know platform. about that. I, I, I guess it's because, again, I'm an ignorant when it comes to the, the new marketing app. You might be right about that, or you, you're probably right about that. But what I think is, is valuable is the fact that I rarely, rarely see people switching marketing automation platforms. That's one of those things that once you implement it and it's working and you have all your campaigns and you have all your automation and everything in place. Very sticky. You're not going to just out of the blue say, you know what, I think we should switch. I disagree with that. Really? I disagree. We have a integration with a the My Emma marketing platform. It's pretty simple and straightforward. And we have a number of people that have come to us that were using Click Dimensions and left them because of some dissatisfaction with the email editor. Number one. And number two, they needed just email marketing. They didn't need the entire suite. They wanted something simpler. Yeah. And they wanted to talk. You know, they wanted to get supported through a, a bulk emailing company, That's that, which is all that they did, which is very focused. And that's one of the yeah, challenges. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm not right. saying it doesn't right. ever happen. But I'm just saying for the customers who are successful, which I hope is the majority, right. the customers who are successful implementing any marketing automation solution, this is not just exclusive to Click Dimensions. This could be Marketo. This could be anything. I think that those customers will not just up and switch to something else if it's working for them. So because Click Dimensions has been number one for so long, because they've been implementing all over the place, because they're growing globally like crazy and grabbing customers in all these places around the world, I feel that it would make sense for Microsoft to put their hands on those customers. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think don't that would be happening. a courteous thing to do, but and Microsoft is nothing if not courteous. But Microsoft is in a position, if you think about it, they could give marketing away for free no charge along with your sales license you get it for free how does any third-party marketing application compete with free yeah i mean that's a good point but like, i don't think they'll do it because yeah. that wouldn't be courteous and they're a very courteous company and, but and we don't have to go into discussion i mean i could say resca survive right after they decided to give mocha away for free um i think that the features and you know again you know resco is is another good example of once you have that deployed, like we have a, a, a customer that has 250 users, Resco users, on a heavily customized solution that was heavily customized before Mocha existed. They're not going to switch. They're paying like $15 per user per year or whatever it is. It's, it costs them. It's more than free. But the headache of having to switch all of that process to out-of-the-box dynamics so they can use the app, which they have upgraded like three times since then. It's not the same Mocha we got back in 2013 or whatever it was. It's been upgraded. Actually, the Mocha we got or maybe the second one we got is now the Phones Express. And we have a brand new app. So that's a fear that some companies have who already invest in the rest. But again, I feel that when it comes to click dimensions, it will make sense for Microsoft to acquire them. Now that they're a global company, now they have customers all over the world. Uh, at the very least, a partnership, but at a partnership wouldn't even make sense since they have marketing, I think, a full on acquisition. So, you know, so you, you kind of contradicted yourself a little there because right. if they were to acquire Click Dimensions, right. they would switch. They, they have a marketing application, more modern, more robust, more yeah. roadmap that they, that they own all the code. They own. If they were to, yeah, acquire, if they were to acquire Click Dimensions, they would say, okay, now we're going to move you. Absolutely. to our application. But that's the only way you're gonna convince these successful Click Dimensions implementations out there. Just like they did with Parature, right? They bought Parature, they ultimately ended up stripping that stuff and moving it away, and they forced clients. I mean, literally, they went to Parature clients and said, look, Parature is gone. We can switch it to Dynamics, so you can go somewhere else, but Parature is gone. And I can see how they could redo that with Click Dimensions. They could go to Click Dimensions customers and say, look, uh, the uh, number one application is dynamics for marketing. You, we need to. Here's the the process to help you get there and do the migration for it. So again, that's why it was uh, kind of a wacky prediction to begin with. I expect you guys to disagree. <laughs> so, um, Steve, I think you're. Yeah. I think you're probably correct, but I think what has to change is that partners need a marketing resource to go to for the Microsoft marketing solution. 
I mean, as a partner, if you're going to go out and sell email marketing, you don't have to be an expert in drip email marketing campaigns. You don't have to be an expert in understanding the difference between hard balances and soft balances. You can call somebody Click Dimensions. They'll get on a conference call with your prospect or with your client, and they'll help you work that through. If you call Microsoft for support on the marketing application, you talk to engineers, not to m people that understand email marketing and customer engagement and conversions and things of that nature. So that's the thing that would have to change, I think, in terms of the structure. And if the they want to become number one, they have to change that. I they, agree. they have to do. They yeah. have to do that. It's not. It's not an engineering solution. And partners don't aren't going to know and understand email marketing like they need to be. Um, you know how to you know put together correctly put together a drip email marketing program. I agree. The typical partner can install the solution. Right. But that for a marketing solution that accomplishes nothing. Right. So so if you have if you're a customer and you're using the uh, Microsoft marketing product and you're having problems composing your email in terms of lining up the fonts and moving this pixel here and things of that nature, who are you going to call? You can call any of the bulk email messaging companies if you're using a third-party application, Marketo, or something like that. Or if you're using the Click Dimensions product, you can call up and they'll help you figure out uh, or and or your customer figure out how to get the email looking just the way it's supposed to I look. Think it, I think it's way beyond the technical pixel thing. I think it's more like I, I, you've installed a marketing application, a customer comes back and says, okay, what should my message be? Well, how should I, right. I'm going to create a drip cam campaign of three messages. Yeah. What should they say? And click not, the pic pixels is technicality. Right. Right. But, it's not a tech technical and that, discussion. And, and, that's, and yeah. that's not a skill set. That, I mean, frankly, that's the reason for uh, when we, we, we got into marketing week, right. we partnered with Coffee and Dunn. And those guys know that part of the business. And, right. and I already knew that, yeah, we could very competently install that solution, but we could not make a customer successful with marketing because we don't have that skill set. And we, we partnered with uh, these guys that have that skill set just to be able to plug that gap because I, I knew I didn't have it. And looking around all the other partners I know, I know they don't have it either. It's, it's, it's less about I got a problem with my pixel placement and more about what are the words in my marketing message? What is the imagery? What is, it, what is the marketing part of it? None of us on this side of the fence have really – I mean, we, we install – Applications, you know, we can figure. Right. But right. That that could evolve because I, there are partners that have, there are there are consultants out there that have like sales consultant professionals, like you know, they put together the the plan. It's not about the technology. Steve is nodding. Okay, <laughs> it's not about the That's technology. True. It's about the um, it's about the processes. And there's consultants that do that. So let's think of like another MVP, um, Rick McCutcheon, who's like Rick's not a technical guy. Sorry, Rick. But he, he puts together his whole business sales processing. And, that, and that's like his thing. That's his full-time job. Yeah. yeah. And so is there a marketing Rick out there? I don't know. There probably is. It's Rick McCutcheon. No, oh, Rick. Is it? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Does Rick know click? I don't I know. Mean, I mean, it's a, muscle, it's a muscle you can grow if you, yeah. if you choose. And, and if some partner decides, you know what, I want to go deep on marketing. I like the application. I'm going to install it. Um, but they're quickly going to realize that my customer is asking me for stuff I don't know. And in our case, I just took a shortcut and, and we partnered with somebody who did. But I could, I could have engaged and hired some marketing people. I could, I could build that muscle if, if I chose to. That's, that's a direction I could see partners taking with marketing. But in terms of uh, Microsoft buying click dimensions, I don't, I, don't see, I, I don't see it. Because it's like, like Steve was saying, they have their own marketing app. For them internally, like why would we... It's sort of like if I went to my wife to say I want to buy a bigger pickup truck, she said, why? You already have a pickup truck. Why would you want? I'm like, well, because it has... Because it's bigger. Because it's bigger, it's nicer, <laughs> and it's not as nice as Gus's or whatever, right? Like, you know, that, that, so that's... Fine, not... buy a new wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Anyways, we're... Uh... But so I, I don't see the upside for Microsoft. I see Click Dimensions evolving a little bit because they have to... Com they realize they got to compete. There's going to be a certain compete with marketing. Um, but... I don't see Microsoft buying them out. All right. Well, everyone disagrees. Great. Great <laughs> no, no, no. I had no opinion. Had, oh, <laughs> For the record. He, he's abstaining. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know. Uh, okay, so I guess your prediction was number seven in terms of the marketing app becoming the number one uh, the number marketing one. automation Far away. solution out there. All right, interesting. So, Jerry, what's uh, number eight? 
So I want to talk about Microsoft Flow. I'm a big enthusiast of Flow. I think it is one of the coolest tools that have come around for citizen developers. And when it first started out, it was really positioned as a personal productivity tool. Now I think the messaging has come to the point where it's enterprise class and it's getting there. And what I see happening in the next couple of years is that it's going to mature to the point where you're going to be able to take the Salesforce connector and the CDS connector, and it's going to come with mappings, and you're going to press a button, and it's going to migrate a company's Salesforce data into Dynamics 365. Interesting. Wow, Flow becomes so, an integration tool. No, 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 he didn't tool. say integration. He said Mig migrate. migration tool. So you do migration. a one-time one push on a, yep. on a... You create a Flow... To do one or there will be there will be a, a template you Re mean, ready like to that. go templates. So yeah, somebody, yeah, like, somebody like, yeah. the product team will put it together or some yeah, ambitious like we ISV. Have, like we have those templates today, like Twitter to lead or whatever. Like right. we have those right. little templates. So Salesforce to Dynamics. Right. It'll handle the mappings. The URLs. Yeah. It'll, hand, it'll handle the mappings. It'll go back and wow. do the parenting. It'll transfer mm -hmm. attachments and notes, and it'll run within your flow allotment. And they'll put it out in a special place. It'll allow you to do. It. Sort of like maybe um, fast track type of thing, but using Flow to take a competitor's org and uh, move it into the. I think Jerry's CDS predicting platform. that because he already has it ninety percent built. Yeah. I'm working on it in my mind. <laughs> so, so, so if funny, I can figure out how to I mean, protect the IP, it's funny I would. that you mentioned that because I wrote sort of a bonus prediction, and you can see it is number three on on my list, which is I think that I predict that the fast track team will start migrating. Salesforce customers because right now this the the fast track team will take a copy of your CRM database all the way to CRM 2011 and will migrate it to online so I feel that it would be a good prediction to say that you could do the same with Salesforce although you can get a copy of the database I don't think but you can do a full export into a bunch of CSVs and them developing a system which could be based on flow right. to boom just yeah. put you up online with all the users and all the records and all that stuff that would be awesome to have and again, that was that was another prediction. It was sort of like a bonus one because here's the thing with Flow and your prediction, which I like, by the way. The problem is that we have limits in Flow. You have only a certain amount of thousands of flows that you can yeah, run. Yeah, but every he's month talking about like a an override for a migration <laughs> yeah. purpose. Yeah. You know, so that for your for your migration one off unlimited to get over to our platform. Interesting. Right. Well, right. That, yeah. that could be awesome. Yeah, yeah. But Jerry, but I like I'm it. curious. I like it a lot. Do you see this as something Microsoft will provide in some way, or is it a community effort to to pro produce this? I mean, everything is open. You can do it. Well, some things that are going to happen is is that. Uh, we're going to see more connectors, and we're going to see connectors with more depth in the near future. And once we figure out, we, I say collectively, the product team figures out a way to protect the IP of a flow connector, just like protecting the IP of a power apps, somebody will go out and write a full function salesforce.com connector. We don't have that today. Yeah. Uh, on the dynamic side, I'm going to assume that they're going to give us something, or we're going to be darn close and be able to take what we got. And you'll be able to create a Salesforce connector that is designed for migrations, and you'll be able to license that. And Microsoft will say, hey, this is great. We'll put you in a flow environment where we're not going to you know, count this against your allotment because we're going to make a whole bunch of money once you buy all these CRM licenses or CDS licenses or whatever we're going to mm -hmm. call them in three years. Uh, and it's going to be really good. So why haven't they already done this, right? We had we got the we had the data loader, right, in 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 lifecycle services. Why we used why, to? I think. Well, we used to, uh, but yeah. but I mean, Salesforce has been a big arch enemy for a long time, and and making it very easy to move. And as you said, Gus, somebody can go push a button and get a full export of their Salesforce data. Why haven't they just given a place here? Drop that data here into this we're, bucket, and we'll automatically shove it into your. I mean. I don't know. It seems like it could awesome. have been. Seems like it could have been done before Flow even existed. I mean, Flow is a way to solve that problem. I agree, so, but it or, seems like or, it's a problem they could have already solved. Why wouldn't you take the lifecycle services, which you do right now, the fast path again to go from on-prem to online, and open that to any CRM? Have a Salesforce and a Soho and a Siebel and an Oracle, whatever it is, have all of these different versions where. You just drop your database there, man, and we'll grab that thing and make it we'll online. Grind it up and shove it in there. I'm not saying it's a bad idea, but where's the focus from Microsoft's point of view? Like anytime they, I hear them talk about Salesforce, it's like it's really the messaging is around those net new customers that are trying to evaluate a system. We need to beat out Salesforce getting in there in the first place. 
I think there is a market to people are already on Salesforce, but if they're already invested in Salesforce or any other system, it's, it's a lot harder to get that customer to switch over to something else. You know, maybe it's because we came from Salesforce, so people think we are like, but, so, but we've done a lot of Salesforce migrations. <laughs> Customers that weren't happy with Salesforce for whatever reason and wanted to move. And Their contract is due and it's going through the roof because that's another thing Salesforce does, right? Where sure. they give it away like almost for free or for free, but then the renewal comes and they exactly. hammer Storage it. Storage jacks and all sorts of, there's lots of reasons people decide they want to get off. Sometimes it's just grass is greener, you know what I mean? Yeah. But, but but those are a big pain in the ass to to move uh, the Salesforce. You get all these CSVs, like you say, and, and it's just a huge pile of work. And it seems like if if Microsoft wanted to, yeah, build a bucket, just drop that in here, and we'll <laughs> shove it over. Just like I mean, they can, uh, the the migrator tool right now for migrating from on prem. I yeah, mean, exactly. They could use same kind of a process just here. Instead, drop your drop your Salesforce database, or like you say, Siebel. I mean, why wouldn't why wouldn't they do that? Why wouldn't they? Because yeah. that would be one reason a sales, I mean, a Salesforce renewal model, that might be big. Someone might actually, and we've had customers decide, you know what, we're going to go ahead and renew because the cost of migrate is too high. Hmm. Well, it shouldn't be, it should be nothing. Hmm. Microsoft just plug that gap, you know, here, your cost of migrate off is zero. Just drop your data in this bucket and we'll do it for you. But instead, you got to have partners like us come in or other partners and it's, it's, it's a hard job. So it's not cheap. Yeah, so this is, instead of a prediction, it's more like a want. Like, we really I, want this. We'll put this that in be, a want, guys. Yeah, we'll put it on the want list. Yeah, we want, want, want. Uh, that would be awesome. Let, let, right. let, let, I don't want to go backwards too far, but let me yes. jump back to the question about the, the your, uh, your prediction, uh, Steve, about the marketing app. Does it need to include leads and accounts to does win what? the marketing app? Not it just, does. Just not contacts? It does. Okay, all right. It does right now. Okay. And they just launched the account-based marketing uh, motion on it. So that, that thing is moving. I mean, marketing is one, uh, is one of those brand new apps that's moving lightning fast. And, and, and it's kind of moving lightning fast in the shadows because everybody's focused on all the other stuff that's, out, that's all out there. So there's people that are kind of looking at marketing out of the corner of their eye. And there's people that are looking that are like right, right in it. But it's moving lightning fast. And, and, and it's interesting because there's a couple of sessions at this extreme event that I'm curious about of people talking about marketing that I know are not engaged with that team directly, like like we and a couple of other partners are. So I'm curious what, what they're going to tell people because I'm thinking you can't have the right data. You can't be up to date on where that, because that, that application has changed in, in a matter of weeks. I mean, it, it is continuously changing. So we've got leads. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's a capability. The licensing model has completely changed now from contacts to marketable contacts. Uh, we've got account-based marketing approaches coming in that thing, really heavy B2B. So there's, there's a lot of stuff coming to that app. And you, if you think things are moving fast in the whole platform, you get down to a particular app, that particular one is really on a fast track. There's a lot of stuff happening to that quick. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, Jonas. Yeah. So my second prediction. Yes, uh, prediction. I, I, I think this also goes in the bucket of the want prediction. Uh, but today at Extreme, there was this uh, R&D panelist, uh, like six uh, hot shots from Microsoft were sitting there. And Matt Barber is talking about, yeah, we have this for solutions and environments. Uh, they're looking at uh, sort of flipping a, flipping a flag in the production environment so that you cannot make any customizations there. You have your managed solutions, you cannot do anything, no one can mess up. So. That's coming near future. What I want is uh, sort of flip that uh, flag thing, have the opposite so that you have to specifically say that thi this environment shall be able to accept unmanaged solutions. And that's a very special flag for development environments. You can only import unmanaged solutions if you have a development environment. Otherwise, all other environments, you have to import managed because then we have well, <laughs> the goal situation where you only develop unmanaged is development environments. Right. So wouldn't, I, I want them you to. Then, wouldn't you then need a flag to prevent things like minimal copies and full copies as well? Yeah, no, because what, what you do then is, I mean, you, you copy your development environments. You, you should be allowed to copy your development environments. No, well, you, you can copy a production, minimal yeah. copy into a development environment. If yeah. your production has a bunch of unmanaged solutions. No, it doesn't. How could it? Because production, you cannot have any unmanaged solutions. No, if, if production has a bunch of managed oh, solutions. Oh, managed, yes. 
and you override it with a minimal copy on a sandbox, which yeah. you can do today, yeah. that would eliminate your unmanaged solutions. Absolutely. And I mean, that's not a use case. That, that's not something you really want to do. Then you would have production data in your development environment. Well, then, not if you do a minimal copy. Minimal copy is just customization okay. and configuration. Well, but it, shouldn't there be a flag to say, don't allow any copies yeah, into this sandbox? Of course, because it's not applicable. I mean, you, it's not applicable to take the production environment with the managed solutions and make it your development environment. I know that. I know, I know that's something you shouldn't do, but you can today. Well, maybe that's you can. Maybe yeah, okay. part of this yeah. you can. So, so you, you need the uh, sort of the blocking thing there as well. Yes. yes. It's like a one-way one street, right? You, you go from development to production. You don't yeah. go back. You go, maybe data you go back. But if you don't have any unmanaged solutions in the development environment, what would you ever push back? Because they're all managed. They, were, they exist here. There's nothing, there's no changes you could have made there to push back. I don't disagree, no. but you uh, can, that's the thing. Yeah. Because, and the because only you thing can do would, unmanaged would right might now be, Well, when I develop, I, I want sort of live-ish data, but then it's not a minimal copy anyway, so. so. So I guess in your prediction or in your dream environment, if I want to test an ISV solution, I have to have a separate sandbox just to test the ISV. I couldn't test it with my existing unmanaged functionality. Yes, of course. You can always import managed solutions. I mean, when, when we develop unmanaged solutions, we build it upon not just XRM core. We have might have the sales app, okay. the first party solution managed. I thought you said we you might want to have flip a flag that says don't allow managed solutions. No, no, no. Don't allow no, unmanaged. unmanaged in production. No, no. I'm talking about the, because that flag is yes. coming, you mentioned. Okay. But you want to flag on sandbox that says don't allow managed. I only want unmanaged because it's a sandbox development environment. No, I, I, okay. What you need is the flag to be able to import unmanaged. If that flag is not specifically explicitly set, you should never be allowed to import unmanaged solutions because the, okay. the, 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 the natural thing, normal thing is you don't import unmanaged solutions. That's a very special case scenario where you have to import an unmanaged solution. All right, Nick uh, is going to disagree for the first time in his life. Watch this. <laughs> but I already me. disagreed with you already. Yeah, he did. No, I, I, so here's, let me just rephrase that. So they're hoping to set a flag on a production environment that if that... No, 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 no. Production environment, you don't have to set a flag. No flag. There, there's always, you cannot have an uh, unmanaged solution in production, of course. Until what? I force somebody to create an XRM toolbox that tur turns that thing yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, I see that. I, I they have to. You should they, explicitly have to say, okay, I am allowed to import unmanaged solution here. That's the exception. Yeah, you know that. So will they? Okay, will they be allowed to do that exception? So Matt, yes. Matt, what On Matt sandbox. said today was, we would give the customer the customer the option to decide. You know what? I'm going to lock my production environment that the only thing that can go in it is managed. It'll be a customer option. So a customer maybe decides, you know what? Awful option. I got a highly sensitive environment. No unmanaged stuff's getting shoved mm -hmm. into this thing. I'm going to just turn on, turn this flag. No unmanaged goes in so there. So they, they opt in it to It would that. be a customer decision to do that. That's okay, what he said today. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, sorry, because I was, I was about yeah. to say if it was a opt out, mm -hmm. everybody would flip that opt out flag. Not everybody. 99% of people would say, yeah, that's great. I need to put in managed solutions. Or they might even say, you know what? That's right, here's our new policy. We're only gonna import and manage solutions. Something goes sideways, they are gonna be flipping that switch to get their fixes in and do whatever. Yeah. And, and by have, flipping that switch, they resign from all support from Microsoft. Yeah, then we, they're gonna to go to a different product. You know, we have, we have several yeah, customers Microsoft today. No, but but, but, but you're, you're talking about current, today, 2018, the way solutions work. Oh, uh, yeah. And we're thinking three years ahead when they fixed the problems and when we have learned to not include stuff in the solutions we deliver with components that we're not really yeah, using. You're, so you're assuming like a lot of the government, the governance model that you should be using with managed should be more built in. The tooling is a lot better. All of those issues that we absolutely I mean, discussed previously. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, from our predictions here, we of course assume that the rest of the world is evolving too. Right. Are you talking about the episode with, that was loaded for the unmanaged uh, solution guys? <laughs> yeah, the, wasn't, yeah, yeah. Wasn't loaded. There was a. We Gus pulled MVPs from all that happened to agree with life. him on that one. 
They you know, I tell you, I, because I, he my, was but, the right approach. But, but, I, but, uh, but the problem then was always, well, the issue with managed solutions is that we face problems today. Yes, because there are problems that need to be resolved. Absolutely. Yeah. And in three years, there will be. Hopefully in one year. Yeah, but I, again, and, and not to go back to that episode. No, but we're not. Even if they fix all the problems, I don't see any benefit of using managed solutions. I just don't see it. What's the benefit? Gus, I hate to say it, but I agree with you 100%. As a company that provides professional services. Why do you services, hate to say it? Wait, 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 wait a minute. Why do you hate to agree Just to with create me? some controversy here. <laughs> okay. you know? All right. Yeah, we, have, so, we, we actually have several customers that have their own policy. It's not, there's no switch. They just have their own policy. Nothing goes into our production environment that is unmanaged. Yeah. It's not yeah. allowing any unmanaged in our environment. They just, they understand that. There is, a, there is a wild west factor to unmanaged, because unmanaged, mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's just the terminology, but, but there's a reality. But they do know that they just don't have to give random people system admin or system customizer, <laughs> right? I mean, I just, again, I just don't see the benefit whatsoever. And, and it's like, so if they make this happen, like what's the achievement? It's nonsense. No, it's just like, but you're, yes, you're going, now you cannot do hey, unmanaged in production. Gus, so what? You, you like, said don't no go difference. into the managed unmanaged discussion. Now you're doing it. Oh, yeah, what I'm is. saying is <laughs> fix all the issues and make sure that the default is, yeah, you import managed solutions, period. But for what? But for what? No, what's, no, 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 no. You're, you're extending the topic. Yes. But that's still you're still rehashing <laughs> the old argument. What are you talking about? You because can't just say, oh, get rid of all the problems and allow manage only. And then when I say, but for what? What's the benefit of it? Okay, no, that's it. Conversation over. It's and cleaner. Walk away. Yeah, so doing. what's the benefit of unmanaged in production? And just to flip that around, yeah. what's the advantage of that? Listen back Thanks to the episode. Thing. Like we listed yeah. like a thousand uh, different benefits. There's a, a ton of yeah. different benefits. Oh, say one. What do you mean one? The, the, you can fix the problems fact that he doesn't very quickly. quickly. No, no, fastly, absolutely. In production? You, in production, is stuff insane? goes. I not insane. Have you have you oh. done a real job like in a real project? <laughs> I, I can tell you, I I agree with Nick a thousand percent. I've been in situations oh where mar marketing needed an additional value in an option set because they just ran an ad campaign and people don't have a value to pick from the pick list or option set, and the uh, sales VP is being told that they're not accounting for leads and the sales VP tells the IT department, fix it today or I'm switching to Salesforce, basically okay. is what they're saying. And so somebody goes in and adds an additional option set value to production and they just move on. It just, and, it, it and happens. They do it, it and happens. they do it in like 10 minutes less time than it might have taken to do that in the development environment and push that update. Oh, again, we're, we're talking about the real world. We're not good, like, we're not good is, there. Yeah, I got, I've, is, got, I've got another idea I'd like minutes? to throw out here on the uh, things Next that might prediction. happen. Okay, my last one, this is a crazy one. That we're actually- Oh, Wait, oh Nick, oh, Nick did go? Yeah. 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 Mine's pretty controversial, so let, I'll let Jerry go first. And mine no, wasn't? No, no, no. <laughs> mine's, ho mine's just hopeful, it's not controversial. All right, all right, Nick, prediction number 10, and then we're gonna go into the bonus round with uh, Jerry's <laughs> okay. final. So I wanna preface this, this is not against any of my, 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 my developer friends. I like to, I, I'm sort of a half, Halfway developer myself, I used to do a lot more, not so much lately, but I would predict within three years, we are going to see AI be advanced enough that's going to empower the citizen developer to replace a lot of the custom coding and advanced coding that's going on now. So right now you do Visual Studio, you have IntelliSense where it's beginning to fill out, you do a power app, the formulas are filling out. It's gonna to get to a point where I need an app to do XXX and there's gonna be AI that's gonna build that code around it. Natural language. Yeah, sort of lifting a level from assembler to C sharp to the I'm next level. It. The and the citizen developer is going to be able to build deep customizations with the help of AI built with that. So I can well, literally I, say, I want an app that will check the trucks in every day, and the AI will go build that app for me and just write it. And That's write awesome. it. And I that actually, would be awesome. I actually had that idea earlier. So one of my predictions was, but I, I sort of turned it on because I thought it was insane, is within three years, no code required. Just That's, everything is will be natural language query or drag and drop, the, no code. But there, I, I think, think there will be code. But, but when you say natural langu language query, that's code. It's a, it's something query. It's something the computer okay. understands. I'm, I'm talking but about it's not language. Jonas. 
<laughs> yeah. natural language. Regular person. I don't think there's any doubt that that's where we're going to get. Whether we get there in three years, that's that's the, that's the question. I, I, I don't I think, think there's any maybe doubt. Maybe not full on, there. but a lot of that will be there. A lot of the coding yeah. we're doing now yeah. will just. And you look at you've seen it already. Look at 2011, the coding you were doing then versus the, you know, the point and click stuff you're doing now. That is just gonna. That's gonna be a hockey stick in terms of acceleration. And like I said, I have I have a lot of friends that are like deep coders, and I think you know I think there'll probably be new stuff for them to focus on, but a lot of the the Visual Studio stuff that's happening today is just going to be very much still point and click, but there's going to be AI helping that along. Yeah, awesome. All right, bonus round, Jerry. What do you got? So this is a this is a hopeful thought. Uh, you know, Microsoft bought LinkedIn a couple of years ago for twenty six billion dollars. That's right. I thought it was going to actually change the whole customer relationship management environment. And it really, quite frankly, hasn't moved the needle. I figured that every company that had customer engagement that sold business to business would buy up the LinkedIn offering, whatever that was. And it, has, it hasn't happened at all. So, I mean, just as an example, I mean, there's just so many things that they could be doing, and I hope they get to it. For example, we're talking about marketing. You do a marketing mailer out of the marketing platform and you get some emails that bounce. When those record bounces, it looks at the contact, goes over, finds a contact in LinkedIn, and then discovers, oh yeah, Billy Bob moved from this company to another company based upon his update of his LinkedIn profile. Report that back to CRM and say, okay, here's what you need to do, Mr. Owner of, the, of this contact record. You need to reach out either to him at the new company or find his replacement at the existing company. Or what if and the that, guy that, was a decision maker and an opportunity? Yeah, yeah. There, so there's, you know, it's, right. There's, so there's no, I mean, we have a widget, which is really a glorified name for an iframe. Um, but the reality of it is, is there's so much unmet integration. And I think it's because the LinkedIn people have just had the stranglehold over their IP and they don't want to give it up. And so they're not the really. They're going to fire everybody at LinkedIn. Um, I think <laughs> no. I think what's going to have to happen is there's going to have to be major cultural change, and LinkedIn is going to have to become part of Microsoft. I don't believe it's part of Microsoft right now. No, it's, it's not. And I think that was part of the deal to not make it part of Microsoft. They wanted to make sure that, it, like, part of the sale. Like from what I understand, you know, the rumors and everything that's in, on the internet is true, is that Salesforce wanted to buy LinkedIn too. But the main difference is that Salesforce immediately wanted to assimilate LinkedIn and use it as their own like internal database, data.com, whatever. Microsoft, on the other hand, said, we'll buy it, we'll leave it open the way you guys are, you keep functioning, you keep being available for everybody, your data can be you know mined by everyone. However, we will improve our own integration because we are now part of the same company. But other than that, everyone else can still mine the data and, and sort of function the same way. LinkedIn uses Salesforce internally. They're a Salesforce company. Um, I don't know if they're using Dynamics today, but I highly doubt it that they already made the transition to Dynamics. I think they're still using Salesforce. And I think that's proof of the fact that they are operating as their own organization. But but it, look, let's look around the table. Has anybody closed a deal because of the LinkedIn integration? No, but I've closed a deal because Microsoft promised to give LinkedIn integration for cheaper price. So I have closed a deal with the customer was sort of like, we want a lower price on the license. We want a lower price on the license. And Microsoft said, look, that's the lowest we can go. But since you're thinking about buying LinkedIn, I'll give you a discount on those. And the customer said, okay, let's do it. But it wasn't because of LinkedIn, of the functionality. It was just more of this being like a sweetener on the deal. So it, hasn't, I, it hasn't given me a competitive advantage. And I recently did a, a podcast with Joel on Joel's uh, CRM audio with uh, Brian Glacia, who's the, the, the PM for, for, right. for LinkedIn on that product, right. talking right. about Social that selling. integration. Yep. And I, I kind of agree with, with Jerry. I, I, I've been underwhelmed by the result yes. of the acquisition. I, I don't know what I was expecting. I mean, I knew that they were just going to become a big dating mining machine for, for Dynamics customers, but I, I was expecting something more. I mean, I feel like... There's third party so I mean I can get more LinkedIn data into Dynamics from Insights than I can from the LinkedIn integration. Right. I mean so it's it's almost like because of the the terms of the acquisition they're they're taking a more hands-off approach 
than, than other people are even allowed to do. They're not even pressing it to the, to the edge of where they can. And, 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 and I think there's, a, there's another level that thing needs to go uh, to, really be, to really be something special. And I think they can do that within the prayer. I mean, if you're a connection of mine and I have a relationship with you, I should be able to push that button and update all of the fields on your record with your latest information. You know, the, right. the, the data enrichment. I should be able to do that because I have a connection with you. I can get that data. If I go to your record, I can copy right. and copy paste. And paste. Yeah, I right. can do that with right. insights. I yeah. can't do that with a LinkedIn integration. I mean, that, that's a that's a simple miss. In my, and just some of those pieces that would make it Oh, no, more, I, I, more I, I totally expect that when they announced the acquisition, I was just thinking about, man, because it, they just recently had announced Relationship Insights, right? It was like the flagship of that version of that release or whatever. And I'm just there sitting like, wow, if they can do this with Exchange and pull all this information and tell us how our relationship is doing based on emails that we're exchanging and how long it took for them to read my email and all of that stuff. Imagine if they can do that with LinkedIn data that they can look back and say, look, they're connecting with your competitors or whatever it is and start telling me like, warning, 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 you haven't talked to this person in two months and they just had three connections with people within your industry. That's a big problem. That's where I saw the value. None of that has happened. Yeah, I think it's like they're taking almost too much of a hands-off approach because they don't want to have the market and, and Salesforce because, oh, look, see, they bought it and there you go. Now they're, they're mining all the data, but it's almost like they like they're over, you know, they've over, uh, uh, Careful. Uh, yeah, over indexed on that, that concern. And it, it got a little too hands off with what they could do with it. Do you think that part of the reason of why they've been hands off is the fact that for them, for LinkedIn with half a billion users or whatever they have, do you think that the fact that if Microsoft got more hands-on with it, do you think they would discourage users from entering their own data, from participating the way they participate today in LinkedIn, knowing that Microsoft has their hand on it? I mean, it's, I'm sure it's a factor in their thinking. It would have to be a factor in their thinking. So it could be, it could be a little bit of fear of, you know, if we get too much in, people will stop using it, which will make the data worthless. We can have our hands 100% in, but if the data is untrusted, no one trusts the data, then what's the point? I well, just so why, so, 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 so it kind of boils back to the reason for purchase. Do we buy this thing to enhance dynamics on our business applications, or do we buy this thing so Salesforce couldn't? And if we bought it just so Salesforce couldn't have it, well, then we're kind of where we would have expected to be because it, it wasn't the purpose. So we just want to keep Salesforce and having it, it worked. you know, and they don't have it. So we win, but it worked. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What do you think, Jerry? I, I think the LinkedIn, the organization is already monetizing the data that we're putting into the system. It's my understanding that they do two things with the data right now. One is they'll go to the company that you work for and say, um, it looks like 30% of the people at your company are updating their uh, profiles and asking for testimonials. You may have a turnover situation pending, okay? Oh, wow. You may have employee engagement. The other thing that they can tell you is uh, we know where your employees are going to, who they're, which, which of your competitors are hiring most of your employees and what's the categories and things of that nature and where they're going and where they're going from there. So there's a lot of data in there that they're already taking and making use out of. Yeah. So I, I, I just think that the perceived opportunity, and I'll admit, hey, I have no idea what you do with $26 billion, and I'm sure that they had thousands of pages of write-ups by each department and things of that nature, but it has not changed the face of customer relationship management with the Microsoft application, and it seems to be an unfilled opportunity that may or may not ever be realized. Steve is nodding again. Steve is <laughs> nodding. Steve and I agree. Definitely. Thank you, Steve. So, as we wrap up the episode, does anybody have any bonus predictions? Yeah, I have, a, <laughs> I have my buy and sell list, the Microsoft buy and sell list. Okay. So, in terms of selling, I see Microsoft selling off GP. It's still a viable business. I think it has market capability. It's still generating assurance revenue, but it's not in their wheelhouse. It's not even... It's funny, Great Plains used to be called Dynamics, but it's not really part of Dynamics anymore. So I see that being an asset that some other third party might have an interest in acquiring. That's just a bold prediction. In terms of their buy list, I have two. I could see Microsoft buying Adobe, and I could see Microsoft potentially buying SAP. What? Throwing that out there. Wow. 
SAP is just such an incompatible organization with Microsoft. I have no idea. SAP CRM, SAP ERP, or everything SAP? They're all in. All the chips on the table. They're not now, inc incompatible. They both all sign the ODI. That's Open true. Data that's true. And that's SAP true. has some pretty sweet database um, IP that can make things fly. And I could see the Microsoft Azure engineers look at that and be a little... Little uh, think that would be cool if we could incorporate some of that into Azure. Yeah, I just feel that, and we don't have to get into an SAP discussion, but I feel that Microsoft is all about creation and you know citizen developer, and you can customize this thing, you can create your own apps and all of that. Whereas SAP is the total opposite: is we have a million gazillion templates. Whether you make you know, if you're a company in Canada who sells chocolate chip cookies that are green to, you know, kids between 10 and 15, we have a template for that. You don't have to design anything. We got it. You implement that template, it has everything you need. So it's sort of like the opposite of how Microsoft sees dynamics and business applications. So that's why I say they're incompatible uh, as a whole. But good, good I prediction. threw it out there. All right, good job. Uh, anywhere else? Yeah, I got my, my bonus is, is in a way kind of a jump off on his. And, and my prediction was uh, that within three years, Microsoft has a single cloud ERP solution. Um, right now we've got uh, two, right? And both of those have been pulled under a single leader. Both of those one or, or more of those needs to get to CDS. I, I don't know that they can justify investing in both of those getting there. I think I think certainly within three years, there's a single cloud ERP solution on Dynamics running on CDS. Okay. so no And, more, I, and I think FNO is the one that that so is. So no more being. business central, I guess. And now FNO is just not for small businesses, right? So you're thinking that they would offer like a business edition of FNO or something like that? No, or? an application is an application, right? Dynamics Enterprise Sales is not for small business, but we made it work for small business with our application. There's a way, I mean, layers, filtering, there, where there's a will, there's a way. Okay. And the cost of a, the cost of making FNO work for a small business has got to be less than managing two code bases, getting both of them onto CDS. They can solve, Good they can solve that problem with one code base, one solution for ERP, invest the same energy into just making that work for different level businesses and make their life a lot easier. I say in three years, there's one ERP. All right. So we talked about, we went from SAP to Business Central and FNO. So this is becoming the uh, ERP, ERP show. <laughs> <laughs> and that's from five MVPs that don't do ERP. Exactly. <laughs> Great predictions, guys. We nailed it. All right, Jonas. Yeah, I got a short one. Last one. And this is really a no-brainer. Within three years, of course, my, Microsoft has hired Tengi Tuzard, sorry, Javista, as a tooling evangelist. And uh, since what? we're... Right, well, and in the spirit of uh, a previous prediction here that they don't bother anymore with the first-party apps, uh, third parties do all that, they're focusing their team efforts on uh, basically validating the tooling that's coming out from the community. Interesting. And would that would that play into the whole acquisition of GitHub and, and all of that? Is that is that part of it? Of course. It, I mean, it it aligns. It's all the open source, and the, you bring in the not the citizens, but the developers around the world, and let them do the job. So not just My, so Microsoft is more like facilitators. Developers. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, guys, it's been a pleasure, obviously, going through these predictions. I wonder where we're going to be at in three years. I do think that some of our predictions will be um, accurate in a shorter term. I don't think we have to wait three years to see them, which is cool. And once again, I want to say for all of those of you listening, Satya, if you're listening, <laughs> these are not these are not based on anything that we've heard. Um, you know, we're not breaking NDA. These are 100% our own predictions based on our observations and in a lot of cases, once our own personal ones that we want to see happen, but we all believe them. So uh, we'll see what comes out of it. Before we go, guys, I'm sure people have comments and questions. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Nick. You uh, my Twitter, uh, at ReadyXRM, um, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, Just definitely. YouTube Brian Shaw, and then they'll find you. What's that? Brian Shaw. 
Yeah, you Brian. Do. Gus thinks I sound like Brian Shaw. For you those sound of, exactly like Brian. For Shaw. those of you who don't know the uh, world strong man, uh, Brian Shaw won the world strongest man either last year, or the year before against uh, a couple years in a row. Yeah, yeah. Um, strong guy from Colorado. I'm actually a power lifter, but I cannot lift what Brian Shaw can. But I guess I sound like him. So. <laughs> you sound exactly like him, Jonas. What do you think? Well, I think the easiest way is JonasRap.net. You find all the information there. All right. Awesome, Steve. Uh, SteveMordu.com. All right, Stephen, you're working on, on some podcasts and some, some content, uh, some cool stuff. I'm playing with it. I'm not as serious as you are and some of the other guys, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm playing with it. That's yeah. awesome. Jerry? Uh, they could get to me at, uh, via Twitter, at CRM Innovation, and there's no S at the end of CRM Innovation. We've only had one good idea. It's not plural. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a continuous idea. Right. <laughs> Definitely. Awesome. Well, thank you guys for, for joining on the show today. And for those of you listening, you can always tune in to all of our episodes at crmmvppodcast.com and follow us on Twitter at crmmvppodcast for news about future episodes and to suggest any topics or guests for future episodes. Thank you again for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one.